Who remembers good old Charlie Brown? Poor, wretched soul that he is. You got to give it to Charlie Brown. He, he's, he's a go-getter. He's not a quitter. He, he's got this temptation, this temptation to kick that football, and year after year after year, the same thing happens. He, he lines up, and Lucy's holding that football, and, and Lucy's like, I won't pull it away, Charlie. And so he lines up, and he's got visions of grandeur in his head, and he takes a run at this football, and at the last minute, Lucy smiles and jerks that football away, and Charlie Brown goes flipping through the air to land very unceremoniously on his back. Now, some of us are too young to remember Charlie Brown. Who doesn't remember Charlie Brown? Okay, good. <laughs> some of the hands were trying to go up. I have to tell you, I cannot watch Charlie Brown. My wife makes fun of me. He comes on around the holidays, all these specials. I cannot watch Charlie Brown because I feel so sorry for the boy. It frustrates me to watch him. He is so tempted by something that he's never, ever, ever going to get to beat. But yet year after year after year after year, he goes back and he does it again and again and again. Does anybody know what I'm talking about, temptation? That's what we're going to talk about today, temptation. That, that little voice inside of you that says, pick me, do this, it'll be okay. And we know going in that nothing good's going to come of it. We know that bad things are going to happen, and yet we're so tempted, we're so tempted that we do it anyway. Now, I wanted to take a straw poll this morning. This is the time of elections and straw polls, so I wanted to take a straw poll. So I am going to ask you to raise your hands. Um, I want to make sure I'm talking to a group of people that, that can relate to temptation. I want to make sure you know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to come up with some for instances, and if this is you, just feel free to be honest and raise your hand. Have you ever, now that I'm speaking to the older folks among us, have you ever been challenged by someone, usually younger, sometimes your 15-year-old son, to do things that you shouldn't do physically? You know that nothing's good going to come of it. <laughs> and yet you do it anyway. Have you ever been on a diet? And along comes that donut or that chocolate bar. And Lori's over there eating something. I just saw that out of the corner of my eye. I'm sorry. <laughs> just wanted to point that out. But have you been on a diet and you know you shouldn't eat that chocolate bar, and yet you're so tempted that you do it anyway? Have you, have you ever been flipping through the channels on TV and you come across some show that's, that's very risque and you should not be watching it, and, and you know you should just keep flipping, but... Your thumb won't work for a second. <laughs> yeah, and you use it. I just want to watch it so I can tell my kids not to watch it. Have you ever done that? Have you ever heard people gossiping at work or, or maybe in church? I know it happens sometimes, and you know you should just walk by and not be a part of it. But something pulls you in, and you stop, and you listen, and maybe you become a part of it. You're tempted to join the conversation. Have you ever... Helen, driven your car along remote roads and there's nobody within sight and you know the speed limit's 55, but there's nobody there. Have you ever, Helen, been tempted to drive faster than you should? Val, you don't even have a license. And finally... No one's going to raise their hand, especially if they're sitting next to their valentine today. Have you ever seen that good-looking man or woman when you're walking down the street? And you walk by him and you take notice and you know that you shouldn't turn and take a second look. But the temptation is just too great. Didn't see a lot of hands go up for that one. All of these and so many more are instances of temptation. Situations that that we know we shouldn't take part in, situations that we know we should avoid, <laughs> situations that we should walk away from, maybe even run away from, and yet we find it impossible to do so. Now, I suppose if we're going to place blame, because we're a type of people that likes to place blame, we can place blame all the way back on Adam and Eve, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> At least a bush. <laughs> 
Adam and Eve, you know, they, they were put in this perfect world. They were given everything. They were given food, a perfect place, no disease. They didn't even have to worry about their wardrobe, you know. I mean, everything was perfect. They walked with, they talked with God, and God said, Look, all I want you to do is to not eat fruit from that one tree. But the temptation was too great. And so as ancestors of Adam and Eve, they passed that along to us. Our, our fault, our, our Achilles heel. When there's something out there that we know we shouldn't do, we do it anyway. So we can blame Adam and Eve. But how, how do we avoid temptation? That's really what I want to get at today. How do we avoid temptation? How can we say no? I mean, most of you raised your hand at one instance or another. It's stuff you should have said no, but you couldn't. So how can we bring ourselves to say no to temptation? That's what we're going to discuss today. But before we get there, before we get there, I want to back up just a little bit and tell you what today is as far as the church calendar because it has a little bit of bearing to our conversation today. First of all, today is the first Sunday in Lent. First Sunday in Lent. Lent is 40 days of preparation moving into the Easter season. Now, depending on your upbringing, your denomination, and your beliefs, a lot of different things happen during Lent. Um, Ash Wednesday began Lent the previous Wednesday and some people paint a cross of ashes or a, a crucifix on their forehead with ashes to kind of kick off the season. Some people give up certain things in their life. My, my wife has given up chocolate before, I know. Um, temptation was too great, but she gave it up for about an hour, an hour and a half. Either way, an hour, an hour and a half. <laughs> Some people spend extra time in prayer. Some people um, uh, give up meat on Fridays and eat just fish. Some people give extra alms during this period of time. Here at Wiggins Community Church, uh, I'm not even sure if you guys celebrated Lent before I got here, but, but what I want to share with you is that it's a time to consider the great joy that we're given on Easter morning. I mean, it's really 40 days to consider what lies ahead, the, the gift of the resurrection on Easter morning. Now, that's one thing, first Sunday in Lent. The second thing is, the second moniker, marker of today is that for about 1,800 years, the church has recognized this Sunday, the first Sunday in Lent, as Satan Sunday. Satan Sunday. You may have never heard that before. Um, but Satan Sunday, now Satan Sunday is not a day where, where we pay homage to Satan, but it is a day that we recognize his temptation of Jesus, and that is why this scripture that we have for today is synonymous with this Satan Sunday. It kicks off Lent. So it's a day that we realize that Satan is real. Now, understand that's me saying it, not you saying it, because I know that in 2016, Believing that Satan is a real, live entity is a difficult thing. Um, not everyone does that. But I believe, and this is just me speaking, I believe that if you, if you negate the realness of Satan, you just set yourself up for failure. Because I believe that Satan is as real as Jesus Christ and as God and as the Holy Spirit and anything else Christian, Satan is real. But, but let's just for a moment... Let's just for a moment make sure that we're talking to everybody and let's just talk about Satan Sunday as a day that we contemplate temptation. Evil forces in the world. So if you want to call it Satan, call it Satan. If you want to call it temptation, call it temptation. If you want to call it some kind of innate evil that's out there, call it that. But today we are going to contemplate temptation. Evil. Evil. And I want you to know as we move into this that temptation is real. And I think most of you realize that. Temptation is real in all of our lives. Temptation pulls no punches. Temptation leaves nobody out. Temptation is something that we all face in all of our lives. And if you need any confirmation of that, look at the fact that Jesus in this text is tempted. Jesus is God, remember. And God goes into the wilderness, and the text says that God himself is tempted. God is tempted. God faces evil. And, and, and if God can face evil, what makes us believe that we're not pitted against evil as well? And again, that's unpopular, because we live in a world now that is trying to smear the lines of good and bad. 
We live in a world in so many ways that tells us that everything is innately good as long as it doesn't adversely affect someone else. Now, I'm not sure which Bible those people that say that read, but my Bible is written in black and white. Of course, it's got Jesus' words in red, but black and white. And I believe God is black and white. And if you read the Bible from one end to the other, what you see is that God has very distinct uh, points to be made about good and evil. All throughout the Bible, God points out to us that there is righteous and unrighteous, that there is good and there is bad, and that there is a right way and that there is a wrong way. I don't believe that God sees gray at all. I believe God sees black and white. And so as we move into this discussion, I need you to realize, to agree with me, to admit to yourself that temptation, Satan, evil, whatever you want to call it, is real and alive in the world. And that there is a propensity for you to make wrong choices and to do wrong things. Because without that admission, nothing I'm going to say makes a bit of difference. If you believe everything's good, then whatever I say doesn't matter. There is good and there is bad in the world. Now, the next thing I want you to see is that temptation often rears its ugly head to us when we are at our highest. This section of scripture comes on the heels of Jesus having just been baptized, and it starts off, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. Jesus had just been baptized by John. God had just audibly said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. God had just acknowledged that Jesus was the Savior. Jesus was at the pinnacle of his ministry. Everything was beginning. Everything was turning up roses. All was good. And the very next verse says, and he's led off into the desert to be tempted. In your personal life, you will find that the greatest temptations come to you when life is going well, when things are good, when you're, when you're feeling good, when your daily life is happening as it should, you've got a good job, your car's running, everything's good, and that's when temptation rears its ugly head. And just like Jesus, you get led off into the desert. Understand that the desert is representative of hell, basically. The desert in Israel is a very, very bad place to be. It's rocks and dirt and no water. It's representative of uh, everything negative. Jesus has got all this stuff going on good in his life, and he's led off into this negative place to be tempted. And that's exactly the way temptation is. You let your guard down when everything's going good. You pretend like there is no evil. You're not on the lookout for it. Listen to what C.S. Lewis said about this same topic. C.S. Lewis said, No man knows how bad he is till he has tried very hard to be good. A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. After all, you find the strength of the German army by fighting it, not by giving in. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. That is why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life, always giving in. We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside of us until we try to find it. Very simply, what C.S. Lewis says is that it's not until you try to do good that you find out about all the negative that's around you. It's not until you stand up for God. It's not until you say, I am a Christian and I, I will follow God's precepts and God's ways that, that negative things, that temptation rears its head. I mean, think about it. If you're way out there in left field, so far from God that you couldn't communicate if you had a walkie-talkie, why would Satan care about you? But when you're doing good things for God, when you're trying to walk the walk and talk the talk, when you're being a good person, that's when temptation begins to fight you. Now, the next point I want to bring is, is for me, really the most profound one, and I think it's also one of the ones that's overlooked the most. Our, our scripture says, as it begins, that Jesus is led off into the wilderness to be tempted by 40, for 40 days, and then he faces these three temptations. 
do you realize that it was 40 days without food and being constantly tempted before Jesus actually faced Satan? And the gospel according to Mark actually says that while he was out there for 40 days, he was, he was tended to by wild animals. So Jesus didn't walk into the desert and begin these temptations. Jesus had to go through a season of temptation first. And what I want you to know is that you will go through seasons of temptation. You will go through periods in your life where it seems like it's one thing after another after another. It's never just one and done. It's always multiple attacks on you. And the reason is, is that, that Satan, evil, temptation, whichever you want to use, is smart enough to know that one isn't going to get it done. One may weaken you a little bit, but two's going to make you even weaker, and three's going to make you even weaker yet, and he's going to keep attacking you with this barrage of temptations. Jesus spent 40 days without food, without water, according to the text, in the desert, a hell-like place, being tempted and tended by wild animals before Satan came to him with these three large temptations. And I want to tell you that there are going to be seasons in your life where it seems like everything you touch turns to garbage because Satan knows that that's how he's going to break you. And temptation knows that one and done you'll be able to take care of, but two and three and four and five you won't be able to. In addition to the fact that it becomes as a season, what I also want you to see is that Jesus, when he does face these three big temptations, is, is hit with three very distinct and different types of temptations. The three temptations, which we're not going to go into in great detail because each one of them is a very long sermon in and of itself. The three temptations encompass greed, fame, and comfort. And if you think in our lives, anything that would tempt us is going to fall under the headings of greed, fame, or comfort. And I want you to know that temptation is going to hit you from all different angles. Not only is it going to come at you for a season, a period of time, but it's going to hit you from the left and from the right. So just when you think that, you know, that you've got past the gossiping, the next thing you know, you're going to see that good-looking woman. And, and when you've got your diet handled, then you're going to want to speed down the highway. It's all different things are going to be hit at you. It'd be too easy if it all came at you at the same way. Temptation. Temptation is, temptation is absolutely powerful. So here's what we've learned about temptation. Temptation is real. Temptation comes at times of our most highest fulfillment, when, when we're riding on top, when things are going good. Temptation will stay with, stay with us for a season, and temptation varies the way that it attacks you. And if you kind of look at all that, you say, man, how in the world can I possibly resist temptation? And the answer to that is, by yourself, you can't. I know we consider ourselves very, very strong-minded people and that we're humans and we can do anything we want, but I guarantee you that not a single person by themselves in this room can resist temptation over a season hit from different angles. When we're at our highest, eventually we will give in. Maybe little, maybe big, but eventually every one of us, if we try to do it on ourselves and by ourselves, will give in to temptation. So how then, how then do we resist temptation? Well, Jesus shows us. Jesus himself shows us the only way to resist temptation. Remember, this is Jesus, God, if you will, in the forest. He could have called down legions of angels. He could have made fire appear from the sky. He could have crumbled mountains. He could have done whatever he did when, when the Satan approached him with these temptations. But this is what Jesus did. Satan said, Turn this into bread, and, and Jesus says, man does not live on bread alone. He says that in order to resist temptation, you need to know God. Jesus says, worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Jesus says to, to avoid temptation, stay focused on God. Jesus says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus says, trust God. To know God, to be focused on God, and to trust God is how we resist temptation. Jesus could have done anything, but he says it's about God. 
And if we make the connection, today we can say it's about Jesus. The way that you avoid temptation is Jesus. If temptation is a question, Jesus is the answer. Jesus, tired and hungry and lonely, says, I can't do it. It's about God. God is the only way to resist temptation. So whatever's tempting you in your life, and if you're trying to go it alone, I, I promise you that eventually it's not going to work. Here on Satan Sunday where we recognize the existence of evil, Satan, temptation, whatever you want to call it, I want you to know that the only way you can resist temptation and continue to walk the path of righteousness is with Jesus. Now I want to, I want to bring you some, some grand theological discovery that I made. For me it was grand and I don't know, maybe you've already figured it out. But let's go back to the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. There's the fall in the Garden of Eden. God puts man and woman there and says, here, on your own accord, on your own accord, resist temptation. They fail miserably. And now we as human beings often use that as an excuse for being bad. Hey, man, you know, we got it handed down from Adam and Eve. We're, that's just the kind of people we are. And we continue to use that excuse to this day. But look what happens at the beginning of the New Testament. Here at the beginning of the New Testament, Jesus is faced with temptation. And he says, no longer are you going to have to deal with the fall in the garden. Everything that was wrong in the garden is now made right through me. Everything that you couldn't do on your own, that Adam and Eve failed to do, you can do through me. We don't have an excuse to give in to temptation anymore. Jesus wiped our excuses out. He says that if I am with you, God, you can resist any temptation that comes your way. So as we make our way to Easter and we work through these 40 days of Lent, what I want to tell you today on the first Sunday of Lent, on Satan Sunday, is that one of the greatest gifts that we have been given is that we no longer have to worry about evil in the world. That each and every one of you is strong enough to resist it. That each and every one of you has been given the power to overcome it. And it's called Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this season of Lent, a time where we can consider what you have given us. Of course, we know about the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. But today we just cause, stop to, to consider the fact that you make us victorious over evil. You give us the power to resist temptation in our lives. And I pray that every person here receive this message. And that they go tell someone else, someone else who's being tempted, that they too can be victorious. It is through Jesus Christ that we pray. And all the Lord's people say, Amen. I invite Bless to come forward. We'll finish today with a song called See His Love. Again, I want to remind you that we have a congregational meeting downstairs to follow and a potluck, so make sure you stay around for lunch. I invite you to stand as you're able and join us in singing. <laughs>